Welcome to this edition of the Interacoustics Academy webinar series, the title of which is Calibration of, of Audiometric Signals. And uh, so I'd like here to give an overview of uh, some of the technical um, considerations and principles at play when it comes to um, calibration of audiometric signals, but um, I would also not like not to lose touch of the uh, the clinical perspective and um, so I'd like to try and seat uh, a lot of the uh, discussion today um, into a, a clinical context that might be relevant for audiologists and related disciplines. My name is Michael Maslin, I'm an audiologist and a clinical trainer with the Interacoustics Academy who are a group of audiologists based in Denmark with um, an interest and an objective for providing education and training in the various different audiological and vestibular technologies and their, and their clinical applications spanning the, cl the scope of, of clinical practice. And here we have uh, just an overview of the um, aims, the intended learning outcomes for this session. Uh, just to reiterate what I was saying a moment or two ago uh, my overall aim is to try and give a feel for the processes of calibration but seated within the clinical context um, mentioning a number of applied issues surrounding uh, calibration, their challenges and um, solutions. I think an ideal starting point is uh, for the discussion is to consider pure tones. Uh, of course this, the simplest type of sound just one frequency of vibration. And of course these are very rare in nature. Real life sounds are um, much more complex with many frequency components and varying um, over time, for example, speech. Whereas a pure tone over time is going to be stable with, of course, just one frequency. But from a diagnostic point of view, um, the major advantage is that we, um, we can assay se uh, selectively different parts of the sensory epithelia uh, to establish the sensitivity of hearing in different regions. So, for example, if I just show um, a schematic of the uh, sensory epithelia, the cochlea. Normally, of course, it would be curled up, um, but I've just shown it uncurled here. And pure tones of different frequencies, as I'm showing in the slide, can be used to stimulate selectively different regions of the sensory epithelia. For example, a high frequency and then progressively lower frequencies can be used um, in this way, and we can establish um, sensitivity and different patterns of, of sensitivity and how they vary across the uh, cochlea can, can tell us a bit about the, um, the pathology there as well as uh, to direct the way in which we might um, manage such a hearing loss, for example, the way in which we could set up the gain of a, of a hearing aid. So that's uh, one of the chief advantages of um, pure tones. Now what we're showing here is a sketch of the dynamic range of hearing for humans. Uh, ranging from a uh, threshold at the bottom there, that line there at the bottom, right up to the upper limit of tolerances. And we're noting this dynamic range here in dB SPL, which you see on the y-axis. And this is a special value referring to the number of decibels relative to the pressure of a 1 kilohertz pure tone sound at the uh, threshold of hearing. That would be uh, 0 dB SPL. And uh, so the, the threshold of uh, the threshold of um, of hearing of audibility, um, it, it's not an absolute value, but an important message from this slide is that we're here giving a mean value, uh, d zero dB SPL is uh, uh, um, the the mean threshold of hearing, as taken from a group of young autologically normal adults. But on an individual level, of course, some individuals will have hearing slightly better than average sensitivity and so would be able to hear sounds at levels below that line and others might hear sounds a little lower than average and might hear the sounds a little above that line. Um, what's also clear is that we don't quite hear as well in, s in some frequencies than others so hearing is different according to the frequency and we can see this curve is lowest so hearing is most acute in the mid ranges but it tails off at the low and the high frequencies. And then if we were to 
add on um, some, for example, common environmental sounds. For example, here we have the speech, um, speech range, and this is uh, commonly the speech banana because of its rather banana-like shape. And we might have other sounds falling somewhere in this range, like music and other environmental sounds. But going back to the way in which the threshold of hearing varies according to frequency, for diagnostic purposes, this is problematic because uh, someone with the same hearing loss at different frequencies will present with different values of hearing loss uh, when measured in dBSPL. So for example, someone with a 40 dB hearing loss at 1 kHz, they should have a threshold of at or around 40 dBSPL. But the same 40 dB hearing loss at a different frequency, for example 2 kHz, that would more look more like a, a 36 dB SPL uh, hearing loss. And the same 40 dB hearing loss at 8 kHz, the threshold then would be some 50 something dB SPL. And so of course this is just one simple example, but it should be quite clear that things would quickly get confusing when it comes to diagnostics due to these differing physical values for the same type of or the same severity of hearing loss. And so what we do to um, to, uh, to to overcome this uh, this uh, challenge is we normalize the thresholds across frequencies to give us a new scale and that new scale is dBHL as displayed on this slide. So here we have um, on the left here an, an audiogram with dBHL for hearing level and the effect of normalizing thresholds across frequencies gives us a flat line for zero dBHL um, on, on this scale. And so when measuring uh, someone's ability to hear sounds or their lack of, then usually what we want to do is to compare their ability, the individual's ability to normal. And so that 40 dB loss that I was describing in the previous example is now appearing again as a flat line. It's clear and, and easy to follow. Um, now one thing to uh, of note is that when we uh, display hearing in dBSPL we can see on the top right chart um, that the y-axis goes from zero upwards whereas when we display hearing in dBHL on the bottom left chart then we can see the y-axis goes from zero downwards and so for an interesting historical account of how it came to pass that um, we as audiologists see to some to, so to speak the world upside down then please I would refer the uh, the interested reader to this um, citation that I'm showing in the bottom there Jirga 2013 why the upside why, why the audiogram is upside down and the full citation is provided at the end there it's really an interesting uh, historical quirky story in any case um, let's consider some examples of common audiological transducers that might be used for different purposes. I'd say arguably uh, for routine adult diagnostic audiology um, perhaps also arguably screening uh, the most common arguably common type of um, transducer is similar to that displayed on the left this is the DD45 um, headphone and uh, the cushions here of this type of, of um, transducer sit against the pinna and so that style is known generally as the supraoral headphone. Sometimes we need other uh, specialist um, procedures, for example, high frequency testing where pure tones are presented well above the normal audiological range. And um, sometimes these, uh, these, the, these, these, um, these transducers can take on a different style. So for example, we have here the HDA 300 Sennheiser headphones and in this style the cushion of the headphones encloses the whole pinna which lends their name circum oral headphones. Moving one over then we can see here um, insert type headphones such as this IP30 inserts and um, these are commonly used in pediatrics for various reasons not exclusively used in pediatrics they also might be used in, in adult audiology um, but, but quite commonly used in pediatrics and then finally as we move over on the right hand side we see this black instrument a bone vibrator and of course bone vibration um, or bone conducted sound as compared with air conducted sound is a critical part 
of audiometry when it comes to differentiating conductive from sensory neural or mixed losses. But when it comes to calibration, we should have uh, some familiarity of the techniques used to measure the performance of an instrument via these different types of transducer. So uh, fundamentally, when, when we want to ensure that the pure tone audiometer is, is performing correctly, then uh, I, I guess at the heart of the matter, then we need to know the answer to two questions. Are the pure tones being emitted at the correct level and at the correct frequency? And over time, changes in the level or the frequency of an audiometer and its transducer pairing can change. These time-induced chi shifts can uh, sometimes be described as a drift, but also mechanical or electrical failure in the instrument or, or mishandling more commonly can occur. And again, this can affect the frequency and the level, amongst other things. So there are many checks which I'll uh, mention later, not an exhaustive list, but a number of other checks. But at the starting point, and arguably at the heart of the matter, is this question here. Um, is the instrument providing the correct frequency and the correct level? So how do we go about answering those questions? Well, from a pragmatic point of view, we have a system that's developed um, on I in a tiered approach, a, th a three-tiered approach, and we have um, on a daily or a certainly a regular basis, um, we recommend um, a, a, a rather superficial but frequent um, series of checks which can alert us um, quickly, well immediately, to any gross abnormalities in the, in the performance of the instrument. And then allied to that will be um, more infrequent but more in-depth checks, which of course carry a time penalty, but um, s help us uh, ensure that the quality um, of the instrument, this uh, power in producing reliable diagnostics, um, to give the clinician confidence in their clinical decision making um, as well as of course financial decision making, test efficiency and um, the management of the patient with hearing aids and so on. And another key objective is to ensure standardization across different platforms and um, in different locations. And so that's the stage B, those more more in-depth but infrequent tests which we'll unpack in more detail. They might be on a pragmatic level performed annually, although the international standards suggest three monthly. Now the stage C that you see there, that might be um, a very, uh, a very um, basic series of checks. By basic I mean getting down to the fundamentals of the um, workings of the instrument and in many cases this might be performed only once or a handful of times in the whole lifetime of the instrument. And so it, it's not going to take up um, too much of our discussion here. But just thinking about those other two, stage A and stage B, let's un unpack them a little more. So stage A, well, this might be something of a subjective visual inspection um, for any gross malfunction, any leads that have been disconnected or fraying, um, or any uh, cracks or other obvious signs of, of damage in the instrument. Um, importantly, we would check do the serial numbers match up I'll mention that in just a moment, um, but also um, a listening check, a biological check. So we might listen without any sound being presented, and so with the headphones on, um, can the audiologist, before the patient arrives, hear any obvious hums or distortion or other noises? And then with some sounds being presented at a low level, and again at a high level or moderate level, are there any obvious um, abnormalities in the pure tones or other sounds being emitted that can be heard by the audiologist. In terms of the serial numbers that I mentioned, this is a very important point here because when an instrument is calibrated with any given transducer, then that becomes um, a unique calibration and it's not the case that a different transducer, perhaps even the same model, can be um, interchanged without uh, invalidating the calibration. There are a number of reasons for this, but included within which will be potentially different um, impedance uh, values for, for different transducers. And if that was the case, um, then uh, the, the electrical load and therefore the, uh, the sound pressure emitted from the transducer 
with different impedances would be um, would immediately give a different output. Now, in terms of uh, stage B, I would really like to unpack this um, discussion in in more detail here. And as I was saying earlier, but just to reiterate, with this particular instrument and transducer pairing, is that producing the correct stimulus frequency and the correct stimulus level? And to help us answer this question or these questions, then we would use um, some specialist instrumentation, a sound level meter and a coupler, uh, a device that can couple or connect the transducer to the sound level meter, so measure its output and that means um, essentially uh, a, a cavity, a microphone um, to transduce the acoustical input back into an electrical input that the sound level meter can, 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 um, can measure. And here we have a, a schematic of, of that arrangement and what we would do is we would take our transducer, position it on the coupler and then measure its output. Now I just want to um, make a few comments about uh, different coupler or ear simulator arrangements before we actually um, go into any more detail on these on these two questions. So what we have here for um, a typical coupler that would uh, couple um, a supra oral style headphone then the, the cavity inside the coupler is um, of a similar or a, a similar size to simulate the residual ear canal volume when that transducer is on the ear. So for a supraoral then um, uh, simulating the adult residual ear canal volume um, the coupler has a 6cc volume. It might be slightly different for um, ear simulators or sometimes called artificial ears but, si but we, we don't need to go into that level of detail here. But the, the effect of these cavities is to uh, is meant to closely match the acoustic impedance of the um, air present in, in the ear canal, as I'm sort of showing here with this red hatch, hatched um, symbols. And then the, uh, the tension that's provided by the headband when the transducers are on the, on the patient's head, that's simulated by a force that's applied to the back of the transducer when the transducer's on the coupler, a 4.5 Newton force. And of course, the the purpose of that there is to um, minimise any any slit vents, any leakage of uh, sound from the cavity um, into the into the uh, outside environment. And then at the base of the cavity, which I'm showing here with a, a red disc, that's where the microphone is positioned, and that's in the same position in the cavity as where the tympanic membrane would be positioned um, in in the real ear. Now here we have a couple of arrangement for the uh, next um, s general style of transducer that I mentioned, the circumoral. And of course the circumoral encapsulating the whole pinner um, around that circular cushion, then the residual ear canal volume is, is going to be somewhat greater than the 6cc um, cavity that we mentioned previously. So what we would do in this case is we would take the same coupler but we would apply an adapter to um, simulate that that uh, slightly increased uh, volume. Whereas if we were to take the insert style headphones, then in this case there's a sponge that's inserted into the real ear, so the residual ear canal volume is now less um, than the 6cc cavity we, we displayed earlier. And now we would typically typically use a, a 2cc cavity for, for inserts. Once again, uh, things are somewhat different for the uh, bone bone vibrator. Here we use an instrument known as an artificial mastoid and this basically uh, consists of a cylindrical um, instrument with a, a rubber surface which simulates the uh, mechanical properties of the, the skin and uh, soft tissue of the um, mastoid area laid over the, bo laid over the bony region of the mastoid but beneath that rubber disc is a, piezo a piezoelectrical um, instrument that converts vibratory force into a voltage which can then be um, uh, measured and then interpreted by a sound level meter. So this would be a schematic here of that uh, rubber uh, disc at the top and then a piezoelectric disc underneath which is physically coupled and is moved when the uh, bone vibrator vibrates to produce a voltage. 
and when the uh, bone vibrator is on the mastoid um, held in place via a, a tensioned headband then to simulate that tension um, then when the uh, when the transducer is positioned on the artificial mastoid then again a, a force 5.4 newton weight is applied to, uh, simu to simulate the tension of the headband okay so that's a brief overview we don't need to go into any more detail for this discussion but with the transducer coupled now to the sound level meter in the appropriate way for that type of transducer then the calibration process really consists of cycling through the different uh, frequencies of pure tones um, of from the audiometer with um, the, the dial setting at a reasonably moderate to high level to overcome any circuit noise in the instrumentation um, and any ambient noise in the testing room hopefully that would be to a minimum anyway and with the dial setting at that uh, level we would then in and that would be uh, ostensibly in dbhl as according to the dial what we would do is we would read the output of the audiometer and transducer via the coupler um, we would read and record those levels on the sound level meter which would be displayed in s sound pressure level and so we would um, check was the sound pressure level for that dial setting correct we would also check uh, checked the, the frequency accuracy again using the function of the sound level meter and if the levels and the frequencies were correct then our calibration checks are done um, and if there was a deviance from the target then we would adjust as, as necessary and um, as per our, de our decision as to whether the output and the frequencies are correct then we have some guidance um, sometimes described as tolerances as to what's an acceptable level of, of error as displayed here so in in essence this is the uh, the question at the heart of our calibration um, procedure so what are tolerances well these are um, as displayed in the previous slide defined in various international standards but what's our target if we're measuring the response in SPL and we have a dial setting in HL then we need to know um, how to derive what the HL value would be in SPL and for air conducted sounds the this information is provided in uh, a set of um, tables or references known as reference equivalent threshold sound pressure levels for uh, the force provided by the bone vibrator then it's the same principle with a slightly different name reference equivalent threshold force levels and a series of international standards described as the ISO 389 series provides um, a whole host of conversions from SPL to, to HL for a range of transducer and coupler combinations essentially what we need here and what these tables represent is the quietest sound that an individual or group of autologically normal individuals can hear for that particular transducer and coupler combination when measured in dbSPL and if we know that information then based on the uh, based on the discussion we had a few slides ago then we can convert between HL and, and SPL sometimes um, the the relevant coupler and transducer combination um, hasn't been described in these standards but it's possible that for example a new type of transducer has been introduced on the market and uh, um, and so the, the the information hasn't been updated in the international standards but it's possible to use other published um, uh, other published norms or references um, where the standards haven't yet been updated so in order to derive what the target sound pressure level should be for that transducer and coupler combination then we refer to this calibration equation so the cut so the, the target level in SPL would consist of the attenuator or the dial setting on the audiometer plus the reference equivalent threshold sound pressure level plus any correction factors that might be required for that particular type of microphone um, and coupler so with all that information we would end up with what the target level in SPL should be but then we would have a look using the sound level meter as to what it actually is um, and we would say to ourselves well do the target level and the frequency match to what we're reading and if the uh, the measured reading does match then yes our calibration check is completed and if no then we would adjust to to within tolerances 
Let's just go through a worked example just to illustrate a few of those points. So here, this first example, I'll do one air conduction and one bone conduction. And this first example is going to be an air conduction one with the DD45 Supra or headphone. And here what we're doing is we're presenting a 4 kilohertz pure tone via the coupler to the sound level meter. And we've got the audiometer with a dial setting of 80. And so to complete the calibration equation in order to derive um, the target SPL, then we would look to see what's the reference equivalent threshold sound pressure level for a 4 kilohertz pure tone using this transducer and we can see that information in the table on the right and I've just highlighted in the red box what that number is, so that number is 9. So now we have two components of the e equation, the attenuator setting, the reference equivalent thresholds SPL. The final one would be the microphone correction, I'll just show you that. So now the, uh, the microphone that we might use in the coupler isn't necessarily equally sensitive to sounds at all different frequencies. As we can see here, it will show you a slightly higher decibel reading for a sound in some higher frequencies as compared with sounds in lower frequencies. And the sound that we're interested in here is a 4 kilohertz sound. And when we see the way in which the microphone um, or the, 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 the correction value for that 4 kilohertz sound goes, then we would need to add on 0.8 dB um, for a derived value. So we go back to our calibration equation, we use the attenuator value that we had, 80, the reference equivalent threshold sound pressure level, which is 9, and the microphone correction, which is 0.8. And then we have there a, um, a target value, and uh, what we can see is that uh, on the sound level meter, what we would do here is we would have a look at what the actual value is uh, that we're that we're reading, so we can see um, uh, so that we can see that the the uh, the frequency is 4,003 hertz, and the target level, or the, the sorry the the actual level is 89.1. So now we're actually within tolerances in this uh, first example. Um, although it's within tolerance, it's probably good practice you might say to um, minimize any even small deviations as far as possible. If you imagine if the instrument was only just within tolerances, then presumably it wouldn't take much time for any possible drift to bring it outside of tolerances. So by, by minimizing any deviation as far as possible, then what we're doing is giving ourselves as much of a buffer zone as possible within our accepted tolerances. Okay, so that's an example using air conduction. I'm just going to go through a very quick example using bone conduction. So I mentioned earlier the B81 bone vibrator, relatively new, um, uh, newly available, uh, and um, superseding to some extent the the, the prior, prior model, the B71. And I'm just briefly showing here a quick comparison of the outputs of these two instruments, very similar in the in the um, high frequencies above one kilohertz, but at and below one kilohertz. The, the B81 has um, additional headroom maximum output around about 15 to 20 dB um, higher. So although you might say the B81 supersedes, I'm just going to use by way of an example um, the, the B71. But if anyone wants more information on the B81, um, a, a, an, an objective comparison can be found using this citation that I show in the bottom left, the full references at the end. But as I say, I'll just quickly uh, demonstrate with it uh, with an example uh, this B71. So again, let's use our 4 kilohertz pure tone. Um, we take the dial setting, the attenuator setting. Now, because we're talking about bone transduction here, then we typically use overall lower levels. Um, if we were to use 80, as we uh, did in the previous example for air conduction, then we might expect some vibrotactile potentially movement of the um, bone vibrator across the uh, across the artificial mastoid which isn't desirable potentially also distortion so we just turn the overall output down and in this example we've gone to 40 and then the reference equivalent threshold force levels for this stimulus at this frequency is 35.5 now instead of a, a microphone correction we have artificial mastoid correction and I'll just mention that now in this uh, in this slide here, which can often be split into two different parts. First of all, we have 
how sensitive is that artificial mastoid um, as measured in the voltage fluctuations that it creates um, when a force is provided and so we the, the, the force sensitivity um, as measured in microvolts per newton um, is in this example 130 microvolts per newton for this individual artificial mastoid in, the, in this example now on a, on a practical level the important thing to note is that we the, we want to express this for sensitivity in decibels not microvolts per newton so I've shown the equation in the top as to how to make this conversion but in addition to the the overall force sensitivity we'd also um, need to be aware of a frequency specific um, effect or difference in sensitivity which can be read off a, a chart like the one in the previous example or, or a table like in this example so the force sensitivity plus the frequency specific component gives us a total um, artificial mastoid correction factor and we've armed with this information we would then um, derive a target SPL in this case 51.5 now uh, with the audiometer outputting the the, de the, 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 uh, the dial setting of 40 as we can see from the screen in the top right of the uh, slide um, so that's the output on the dial and then we'd refer to the uh, measured output by the sound level meter and then compare that to the target or derived output and the measured output here is 51.2 as, as compared with the derived output 51.5 so they do match to within tolerances there's ever such a small deviation and the frequency is um, on the nose so there's a couple of examples as to how we confirm um, or check the calibration and adjust as necessary before we move on um, then it may be um, that you're wondering well how do we know that the sound level meter uh, the microphone and the coupler uh, arrangement is itself providing an accurate measure and now to, that's a good question if you are wondering that and to, to answer this well we have um, an independent check of this arrangement which we would do ideally at the beginning of the whole procedure and the independent check stems from the use of um, a separate instrument known as a sound level calibrator there are different types available but this one I'm showing here produces a 1 kilohertz pure tone sound which is at 94 decibels or 1 pascal in terms of pressure and what we would do is we would attach the sound level calibrator to the coupler microphone and SLM arrangement and then we would measure the output and here we can see that the SLM is displaying 94 dB SPL and it is displaying 1 kilohertz so that tells us independently that the SLM is uh, giving us an accurate reading um, and then that allows us to within with confidence uh, check the, the audiometer output and these sound level calibrators are themselves independently checked um, and so you can see that this provides us with a web of uh, or a network of um, uh, instruments that are checked for accuracy against one another with a with a with a traceable um, uh, documentation to show that okay so having checked frequency and level then it might be worth us just double checking or co considering some of the common checks that might be performed during audiometer calibration an important one is known as attenuator linearity and so when you think about it if we have the attenuator set to one level 80 then it doesn't necessarily mean that we're automatically calibrated at all of the other levels so to get around this challenge then we perform a procedure known as attenuator linearity whereby we um, check the output on the sound level meter not at just one level say 80 but at several different levels so we might change the output by moving in steps of 10 or 5 dB upwards and downwards in, in a range from that center level 80 and what we would do is we would check the change on the SLM um, matched the step changes on the attenuator so if we moved the attenuator down by 10 dB the reading on the SLM should move down by 10 dB if we moved the attenuator down by another 10 dB then the SLM should also move down by another 10 dB and so if we were to plot this on an input output function we'd end up with um, a linear input output function as I'm showing in the center there 
So that's the attenuator linearity. If there was an, any non-linearity, if we moved the attenuator by 10, but in reality the, uh, the output only changed by 8 or 6, then now of course that, that means that we're not um, outputting the intended level and so we, that alerts us to um, a, a calibration error. Another important check is distortion. So when we play a pure tone, uh, central to the whole concept of pure tone audiometry is that we're, um, that we're playing a frequency specific sound that stimulates a, a discrete region on the sensory epithelia. But if there was any distortion to that signal, that would create or, pot or potentially create uh, um, excitation or um, activity that's detectable at different places in the sensory epithelia and it's potential that, um, that that activity could be heard and, and not the activity at the intended place of excitation. This might be known as off-frequency listening. So this could give us a very different impression of the hearing sensitivity as to what's in reality the case. So we check to make sure that there's an absence of any excess distortion. Another important check um, or a couple of checks would be known as the on-off ratio and, and crosstalk. So how much um, uh, sound if we play through one channel might be um, uh, appearing in the other channel. It should be a very, very low percentage. Of course, if there was excessive crosstalk, if we stimulated the right ear, but in fact sound was um, emerging through the left channel, then this would um, potentially interrupt or dis disrupt the accuracy of your test because of the binaural sensitivity of the auditory system. It would drive the Stenger effect. And for anyone who is um, uh, would like more information on the Stenger principle, well, we have a more detailed um, uh, description of this principle that we'll we'll discuss in a slightly later lecture. And another um, concept of audiological calibration that's been used is the Stenger principle. So we change 